are these people? So warning, this article is long. Yes, yeah, so it's again, that's for me, that's for me, that's <clears throat> typical. But because I like to be very thorough with my information. At least I say I like to Louis, be thorough with my information. Louis Thoreau. But, but mm. I I think for this, it deserves looking at it in full. Um, especially given what is happening right now, to really understand the implications of I APAC and just the strength, not just in Congress, the stranglehold that it has, but w in world affairs. Um, case in point, um, let's play this TikTok okay. of this person kind of sharing you know, this in regards to her thoughts about APAC. Even Katie Porter is bought and paid for by APAC. I didn't know what APAC was three weeks ago. Wait, Katie Porter sounds like a Republican on Iran and Hamas. One of the leading Democrats vying for the late Senator Dianne Feinstein's seat, Porter recently suggested the surprise attack on Israel by Gaza's militants were in part a result of the American inaction in Iran. Ugh. Somebody throw that fucking whiteboard at her forehead. Because she forgot to drink her V8, obviously. Um, I didn't know what political Zionism was three weeks ago. I just knew about um, John Hagee, the evangelical seven mountain maniac that's a Christian Zionist manifesting Armageddon. I had no idea that there were people in our government that supported it too. The vast majority of our politicians are all fake bad actors bought and paid for by special interest groups, corporations, and lobbyists like APAC. If you're my representative and I find out that you are bought and paid for by APAC, I don't care what your political affiliation is. I will not vote for you again. Good for you. I mean, we, I mean, we should all be honestly thinking this way. Like, yeah, we, we, we a lot of us have politics. been. Already. Right, but not like, not the not in mainstream. Like yes. Like we ask, but and we look at this, but like normal shmormal people don't ask <laughs> normal shmormal. Uh who are you funded by? Like yeah. what are your principles? What your, who are you affiliated with? Where's the money, Lebowski? Like, who, right. Like, cause that's such a key thing as far as policies because you know, and we said this, you know, when poli like policy goes out the door, the moment any one of these politicians steps foot into Congress is all yeah. about what the lobbyists want and how much money they're willing to give you to buy you Show off um, to enact their policies. Yeah. Where's the money, and Lebowski? So, Cara Mariana... Uh, otherwise known as the flautist, um, reports on this in regards to APAC in Consortium News, uh, where she says, where she tells the article, Israel lobbies disastrous dominion. APAC has involved the U.S. in a revolving crime against humanity that will almost certainly undermine American security at home and abroad. Uh, it must be broken. So, as I said, this is going to be a long article, but hopefully by the end of this segment, you get a better understanding of who ACAC is and their significance and why you need to be well aware of them in terms of moving forward as far as our politicians and how our current politics goes. So, anyway, let's get into it. The United States will not be able to deal with the vexing problems in the Middle East if it cannot have a serious and candid discussion of the role of the Israel lobby. John Mearsheimer and Stephen Wolf. Mearsheimer, yeah. As Israel him. began accelerating its bombing campaign in Gaza last month, the President of the United States sat with Israel's Prime Minister at the start of an Israeli war cabinet meeting. Benjamin Netanyahu, who had phoned Joe Biden two days previously, to request what the Times of Israel called a solidarity visit. Much has passed since Biden's visit to Israel. The atrocity of Israel's discriminate 
military campaign in Gaza is now widely recognized as constituting a genocide. Principal non-Western nations, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Honduras, began last week to sever relations with Tel Aviv, or we call the ambassadors. Since then, an additional five countries have pulled their ambassadors from Israel, including South Africa, Jordan, and Turkey. The world order, as should be obvious, has been disrupted. But questions remain. What does solidarity as Biden's pledges mean when Israel is daily committing war crimes for all the world to see? Why is the U.S. in violation of international law and everything it claims to stand for, aiding and abetting Israel's agenda of ethnic cleansing in Gaza? Why, bringing matters closer to home, is the United States prioritizing the interests and security of Israel above its own, while simultaneously, simultaneously damaging its credibility and authority abroad? These are questions that we have asked constantly over the last few weeks. You can zoom out. These yeah, questions close. raise the subject of the role of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC. U.S. foreign policy aligns so congruently with APAC's agenda that there is little distinction between them. In effect, the U.S. lacks an independent foreign policy that reflects its own security interests in West Asia. At this critical moment of violence, human suffering, and chaos, we must recognize that APAC, an unelected, technically non-government agency, exercises an excessive, wholly inappropriate influence in global affairs as well as in U.S. politics. This is rarely mentioned in our corporate media, and we can read this silence as a measure of the organization's unacceptable accumulation of power. APAC's influence on U.S. policy, domestic as well as foreign, has been considered many times. Most notably, there is the work of John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt, whose 2008 book, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, stands as the most extensive examination of APAC's political, of APAC's power we have to date. Their anal analyst is now more pertinent than ever. In the current context, given the magnitude of what is unfolding, given its potential impact on relationships among many nations, we must recognize that APAC's reach extends well beyond Washington or West Asia. Indeed, the committee's influence is now evident in world affairs altogether. This is our disturbing reality. Lobbying is paramount among APAC's various activities. As a lobbying group, it devotes its efforts to ensuring that the U.S. policy in West Asia, one, prioritizes the containment of nations considered hostile to Israel, especially Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Two, prevents these countries from acquiring effective deterrence to Israel's nuclear arsenal. And three, precludes any viable solution to the Palestinian question, a crisis caused when the state of Israel was founded and the homes and lands of indigenous Arabs were forcibly taken. Ranked among APAC's most significant efforts, it was intimately involved in getting Congress to support George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq in 2003. As reported recently by Eli Clifton in Responsible Statecraft, APAC sensibly repeated the Bush administration's enormous claim that Saddam Hussein was in league with al-Qaeda. In the Israel lobby, Mishmarmer and Walt quote APAC's executive director Howard Core statement to the New York Sun in January 2003, two months before the invasion, in which he acknowledged that quietly lobbying Congress to approve the use of force in Iraq was one of APAC's successes over the past year. Disturbingly, as Clinton, Clifton reports, APAC has since worked to expunge evidence of its support to, for the unpopular war from the record. The multi-party agreement... Oh, the multi-party agreement governing Iran's nuclear programs was never among APAC's major targets. In 2015, it spent millions in on a successful attempt to kill President Barack Obama's signature diplomatic record accord, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This was a major hopeful step towards normalizing relations with Iran and ending decades of crippling sanctions. Undeterred, the lobby continued working to undermine the accord after it was signed in July 2015. Finding an ally in former President Donald Trump, whose campaign was heavily influenced by members of the pro-Israel lobby opposed to the JCPOA, notably Robert Mercer and Sheldon Allison, 
Financed. Impact, we've doubled acceptance. Huh? Yep. Financed. Yeah. APAC, we doubled its efforts, sending thousands of lobbyists to Congress in the months leading up to the U.S. withdrawal from the agreement on May 8, 2018. It was among the first major policy reversals and one of the most consequential of Trump's presidency. The Israel lobby, led by APAC, exerts inordinate influence in all government discourse and policy matters related to Palestinian sovereignty and rights. Voices in support of Palestinians are almost never heard of within the government, a prohibition APAC has cultivated over many decades. Any critique of Israel or APAC in turn is labeled anti-Semitic and swiftly punished. And we've seen this already uh, with Rashida Tlaib. Congresswoman, Congresswoman Ilman Omar, for example, was removed from her position on the Foreign Affairs Committee in early 2023 for comments she made on Twitter questioning the financial relationship between APAC and members of Congress. A recent Washington Post article, in Israeli-Palestinian battle to swell Congress, only one side wins, describes the unparalleled and unrivaled power has over public discourse and ultimately American policy. Pro-Israel lobbyist groups and individuals contributed nearly 31 million to American congressional candidates during last year's election cycle more than six times the contribution candidates received from the gun rights lobby, according to Open Secrets, a Washington nonprofit that tracks campaign finance and lobbying data. With this reality in mind, a dangerous reality given a extremist character, let's consider Biden's visit to Israel last month. Mm -hmm. Biden has given two speeches since that war cabinet meeting, one in Tel Aviv on October 18th, the other upon returning to Washington when he addressed the nation on October 20th. In each, the president reiterated all of the talking points and established dogma that have long characterized the U.S. relationship with Israel, all of which support Israeli priorities. Nothing new was offered, no more clarity, no fresh vision of how to address the original moral crime committed against the Palestinians when their homeland was taken from them 75 years ago, a theft of land that accounts for the new, never-ending cycle of violence we witness once again. Biden performed on command in Israel. He was called to Tel Aviv and answered the call solely to legitimize what was profoundly illegitimate and to provide political cover for Israel as it finds itself increasingly alone in a world in which few nations beyond the West sanction the crimes it now commits. You want to say something or? No, you're good. Okay. He assured Israel of U.S. unconditional support and subsequently promised $14.3 billion in new military assistance. This is top of a 10-year package of $38 billion committed during the Obama years. In short, Biden has licensed Israel to do whatever it wants, and Israel is doing just that, including raising Gaza City to the ground and ridding the north of the territory of all Palestinians. Two factors explain this abject policy failure. First and obviously, this president isn't capable of statesmanship of the magnitude required. Moreover, he professes a deep personal affinity for the Zionist vision, for Israel to seize all the lands of biblical Palestine as its own, and no incentive to do anything other than align himself with Israel's interests. Let's see. And you want to see that? Play the clip. There is this inextricable tie between culture, religion, mm -hmm. ethnicity that most people don't fully understand that is unique and, um, how can I say it, um, so uh, strong uh, with Jews worldwide. There is a, there is a, I mean, you know, I used to say early on when I was a kid, I'd say when I was a young senator, I'd say, if I were a Jew, I'd be a Zionist. I am a Zionist. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I've said this before. This isn't the only time he said this either. He said this recently. Like, right. there is so, you know, also, Lack of stutter there, huh? This there is this like he seems to be able to talk just fine there, huh? 
Right. I'm just saying, you know. Uh, um, okay. Keep talking anyway, so I can go pee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hold on. I think I skipped. No. That was that was it, I think. Okay. Is that there is this Joe inextricable Biden? There you go. Okay. More importantly and directly to my point. With Biden serving as an almost perfect example, no new thinking and no new policies are ever possible because of APAC's stranglehold on the U.S. elections, politics, and politicians. The world is a far more dangerous place, far more Palestinians have been killed, and the U.S. is a far less secure since Biden's visit to Israel. APAC is more or less directly responsible for this. It should not be difficult to miss the gravity, the peril indeed, of the post October 7th crisis in West Asia. The region threatens to explode and there is no leadership in the United States in large part because its foreign policy has been shaped by a special interest group that has worked for decades on behalf of another nation. Uh, actually, I'm gonna need Reef to come back. <laughs> um, but so yeah, so while when Reef, while Reef comes back, uh, so yeah, it just kind of goes to show how how heavy footed APAC is in terms of their policy. And actually, now I'm thinking about it, I have to wonder how much more uh, do they have an effect on current domestic policy, whether it be like Medicare for all or like uh, $15 minimum wage or policies that are extremely popular. Um, Reef, you're back? Yeah. Okay. I got another clip for you. Okay. I want to just clarify one thing, Senator, if I might. You support a humanitarian pause in Gaza. Some of your fellow progressives say that there should be a full on ceasefire, which would require an agreement on both sides to halt the fighting. Do you support what? a ceasefire? And if not, why not? Well, I don't know how you can have a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire, with an organization like Hamas, which is dedicated to Ugh. turmoil and chaos and destroying the state of Israel. And I think what the Arab countries in the region understand that Hamas has got to go. So, uh -huh. so what was significant about that clip, I think a lot of you remember, was that APAC tweeted this out. So... So even Bernie Sanders, even though I don't think he takes any money from APAC, um, or such donations from them, rather, allegedly, still affected I, I, by I feel allegedly. like he might. Uh, I I checked Open Secrets. I haven't I, seen it. I, 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 I haven't just seen. Uh, yeah. But then again, the most recent that I think is available is from 2020. I believe it was what I looked at. I don't think uh, the totals for 2022 have been uploaded yet but so yes allegedly but I, even if he didn't you know i think yeah. the lobby is so strong regardless that right you're talking to him you're seeing him in the lunchroom like it's enough yeah so, so doesn't have to take money in order for, for even him to be influenced by them yeah. um but anyway washington's unthinking pro-israel bias has been blinded you has blinded US policy elites such as no one in Washington, and certainly not Biden nor Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, appears to understand that there is a seismic shift in global power taking place. US security and standing in the world, US security and standing in the world are suddenly more precarious than they have ever been in the whole of its history. Excuse me. The US is being damaged is seriously damaging itself by the continued unwavering support of a nation that is so clearly out of control and that has been recognized by many human rights organizations as an apartheid state. Supporting Israel is no longer in the best interest of the United States, if ever it was, and it's becoming an increasing liability. Move forward. There we go. We cannot any longer overlook the role of the American Public Affairs Committee in all of this. It bears considerable responsibility for this global upheaval 
and for the damage the U.S. sustains as it supports the nation APAC serves. Founded in 1954 as the American Zionist Committee for Public Affairs. Uh huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like it only recently changed the name. Yes, continue. Right. <laughs> so they just call themselves Zionists even back then. Right. So APAC's mission was at the start threefold to advance a pro Israel agenda within the U.S. government to shape public opinion in support of Israel, to close ranks within the American Jewish community, so creating a monolithic and united Jewish front by censoring and ostracizing any Jew who criticized Israel, Which no it matter still what does. Israel did. Still does. It's still what from it the does. Beginning, from the beginning, then, APAC's mission was bound to be detrimental to U.S. democracy and policy alike. Hmm. I so, wonder why. See, uh... Wish we can have her ever have her on, but we've heard her many, many times. Caitlin Johnstone yeah. tweeted this, friendly reminded that none of this would be happening if America was a real democracy. So this is a data for progress poll where 66% of likely voters agree that the U.S. should call for a ceasefire and de-escalation of violence in Gaza to prevent civilian, civilian deaths. And I think in this, it shows that 80% of Democrats support a ceasefire in the region right now. And I think mm. over half of Republicans do. Right. So just goes to show how much disdain the Democratic Party has for its base that they don't even care, even in this issue, for instance, to call for a ceasefire. Right. Um, but let's continue. Let's zoom out. The pro-Israel lobby, as we now have it, emerged as a public relations response to a massacre of Palestinians in the city of Kwaiba, I guess that's how you say it, 70 yep. years ago Maybe last yeah. month. Like that. Doug Rosen now, an academic historian, describes the events in The Dark Roots of APAC, America's pro Israel lobby, published March 6, 2018, in the Washington Doug. Post. Doug's. Doug's name sounds like what you ask your stoner friend for in the middle of Doug! Rosin, now! Like, that's what that... <laughs> Sorry, bro. You know. Um, um, on October zoomies? 15th... No. Zoom out. That's yeah. On October 15th, 1953, all hell broke loose. News spread that a special Israeli army unit had stuck, struck into the Jordanian-occupied West Bank and committed a massacre in the Palestinian village of Kud Kuwaiba, yeah, killing more than 60 civilians indiscriminately in retaliation for the murder of a Jewish woman and her two children in Israel on the night of October 12th. The strike reflected Israeli policy. Prime Minister ben, David Ben Gurion had fixed on a policy of reprisals, military assaults intentionally disproportionate on local Arab populations as a resp response to such attacks. After yeah, the ben, October 18th, ben Gurry in like the canal. Yeah. Uh, after the, yeah, after the 10, October 12 killings, Ben Gurion and top colleagues chose nearby Kwaya to suffering retri to suffer retribution. Yeah, Time magazine carried a shocking account of deliberate, even mass casual mass murder by Israeli soldiers of Kwaya, slouching, smoking, and joking. Yep. The New York Times ran extensive excerpts from a UN commission that refuted Israeli lies about the incident. The response from Washington was immediate. Aid to Israel was suspended. At the UN Security Council, the United States supported a censure of Israel. This was during President Dwight Eisenhower's first term in the White House. Today, any American response of this kind of to Israel, Israeli violations of international law it's inconceivable. Testimony to APAC success. Ben Gurion's policy of asymmetrical retaliation is precisely what is now happening in Gaza. It's the enactment of a long standing Israeli strategy of inflicting maximum casualties on Palestinians to crush them into submission or, failing that, eliminate them completely. America, it must be noted, 
remains silent. This is the historical context that APAC has successfully erased from public discourse and memory. In direct consequence, when Hamas launched its attack on October 7th, Israel was able to deny that their own policies helped to create the conditions that set the stage for the Hamas strike. This intentional erasure of history enables the Israel lobby to twist public perception so that American sympathy lies with Israel while the suffering of the Palestinians remains marginally invisible. APAC's influence on US policy process and within party politics is well known and well documented. No one makes it into the White House and very few are elected to Congress without swelling featly to Israel and the American Israel lobby. Few politicians last in political office without accommodating the demands of APAC. The lobby spends millions of dollars promoting its favorite candidates while aggressively undermining any who express criticism of Israel or concern for the plight of Palestinians. <coughs> yes. You have clip. I do um, have a clip. Uh, hold on, let me... Um, yeah, so this is a C-SPAM clip. Uh, and we don't have to play the whole thing. You will get the first minute or two. Okay. Um, so this is in Congress, and uh, hold on one second. I just want to make sure I get this right. So, so this I'm is a House Judiciary Committee um, yeah. about hear, a hearing about free speech on college campuses. Mm. So to give you context, and pro pestilian protesters. To try to disrupt uh, this free year. speech so, on Colin campuses, you think Ben Shapiro would be all over this, right? right. Um, so, thank you. So, like I said, you don't have to play maybe half of the clip or even the first minute, but you'll yeah. get the idea once it's played. Ranking Member Nadler and members of the committee. Committee will be in order. Committee will be in order. Yeah, bring them towards the mic. Uh, or towards the mic. Being here, but uh, the committee has to be in order. If you, there you go. We will, we will we will remove every single person who disrupts the committee. I see a lot of kufkis. That's gonna be a minute. Yes, towards the mic. Gentlemen is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the committee. My name is Connor Ogrijak, and it is an honor to bring my experiences before you today. Let's do one more. Although I had hoped. Um... <laughs> yeah. Whatever, man. Committee will be in order. Yeah, girl. They got the blow dart. They got the blow dart in there. <laughs> Although I had hoped that my arrival to Here's pirate. Yes. Is this go it goes for four minutes of this every time, right? Yes. Nice. Bro, you've had practice at this. You've done two, three already. Okay. And comedy comes in like nines. Mr. Agrijak, <laughs> we'll, we'll keep trying. Yeah, we will. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the committee. Three, two, to yeah. The genocide of their families. Good for you.
Excuse me, ma'am, right this way. Like, okay, now the issue is that they can't remove, like, all of them at once, because that would be... Well, I'm sure, most, I'm sure most of them are not part of it. So. It is an honor to bring my experiences. Palestinian students should not yes. be sent <laughs> You want to talk about putting money where your mouth is. God, great timing, guys. Over 10, I think our audience is enjoying this. Yeah, like they're here. Half of whom are under the age of 18. And you're going to send money and talk about this. Where are these lying students in this room? Nowhere. So you are not. Nowhere. Yeah, exactly. Murder. That's right. My name is Connor Ogrijak, and it is another one. My experiences before you today. Although another I hope one. That my arrival to higher education would mark the arrival to a bastion of free speech. Many, many of my firsthand experiences oh, of freedom of speech. Oh, Lady with the hands. Of University of Buffalo, <laughs> and my of the US chapter of Young Americans for Freedom. I mean. Good for you. Good for you. <sighs> shout, out to all, shout out to all of them. So great mm -hmm. job. That's what should be happening constant. Not just for this, yep. but for everything. So, yep. um, nice meme. Yep. But anyway, let's continue. Um, obviously. Oh, I clicked. Obviously, U.S. foreign and domestic policies should reflect and respond to American security interests and the needs of its people, and not the needs of Israel. I mean, I mean, yes, <laughs> but people somewhat have an issue with this. Um, it is therefore not surprising that a key feature of APAC's propaganda is the fiction that U.S. interests naturally align with those of Israel. Mm -hmm. Well. Well, here's the thing with that. Yeah. How is it that they Israel has universal health care, but we don't? Because we fund their, because we give them money for military that they don't have to spend on the military. And therefore, they can put money into things that actually matter. I mean, they say that our interests align, well, it's more for the military, but not necessarily for like socialist policies. No. So, yeah. But, but no, even though we give them aid like, for that too. But, but right, but our economic interests, that's what they mean. Our mm -hmm. economic interests align with Israel's. So mm -hmm. so fuck progressive policies that actually help people here, even that even though Israel has some some of the things that we don't have. But yeah, I digress. Um reinforcing this, APAC routinely files. Files? Yeah. yeah. New congressional representative flies. Sorry. Yes, they will accept yeah, Ambassador right. of Israel, uh, DJ Khaled, is coming to Congress. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Reinforcing this, APAC routinely flies new congressional representatives to Israel, where they meet with government officials in the process of pro Israel indoctrination to secure continuing U.S. political, financial, and military support. <clears throat> New tutorials looking at you, uh, among others. In reality, U.S. uncritical support of Israel has long invaded the Arab world, making the U.S. less safe and was one of the motives behind the 9-11 attacks. APACs reach extensively deep in, deeply into the legislative and executive branches of U.S. government, U.S. think tanks, foreign policy elites, corporate media, and academia, a phenomenon extensively researched and documented by Mir Schmeimer and Walt. In a working paper published in 20, 2006 under the same name as their book and available on the link, uh, we'll probably uh, add the link in the description for those of you who want to look at that. Yeah. The authors had this to say. Were it not for the lobby's ability to work effectively when the, within the America political system, 
the relationship between Israel and the United States will be far less intimate than it is today. 17 years later, this reads like a gross understatement. The Israel lobby is effectively running U.S. foreign policy in West Asia and funneling billions of dollars to Israel in support of a racist Zionist agenda, a system of apartheid, according to UN and Amnesty International, that weakens the United States, undermines our domestic policies and welfare, and destabilizes the entire region. Here again are Mirschmeyer and Wong. If the lobby's impact were confined to U.S. economic aid to Israel, its influence might not, might not be that worrisome. Foreign aid is valuable, but not as useful as having the world's only superpower being its vast, bring its vast capabilities to bear on Israel's behalf. Accordingly, the lobby has also sought to shape the core elements of the U.S. Middle East policy. In particular, it has worked successfully to convince American leaders to back Israel's continued repression of the Palestinians and to take aim at Israel's primary regional adversaries, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, as well as groups like Hezbollah. As we have it now, U.S. support for Israel's brutal disruption of Gaza, its project of ethnic cleansing, for which the U.S. is now complicit in war crimes and genocide, is due largely to decades of AIPAC's lobbying efforts particularly in Congress. APAC's influence is such that it has involved the U.S. in a revolving crime, revolting crime against humanity that will almost certainly undermine American security at home and abroad as it threatens to expand into a regional conflict. No lobby should have this kind of power. It is very difficult to criticize Israel and U.S. policy that favors Israel for several reasons. First, Media coverage of events in West Asia has long been slanted in Israel's favor, so that it is almost impossible to get unbiased information from mainstream news sources. Related to this, and as I've already mentioned, the historical context surrounding the conflict has been erased by the press and in public memory. Last, one of the more cynical strategies APAC employs is branding anyone who criticizes Israel as anti-Semite, an accusation it happy to habitually and obviously uses to censor and silence dissent. So here, as we can see, you know, as an example, a tweet from Alex Payne, Columbia University is suspending Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voices for Peace as official student groups for, for the end of the fall term. So mm. we've seen this, if not getting worse, in different college campuses across the country. All that I outlined here has made it impossible to resolve the need for Palestinians to have a secure homeland, whether that is a one or two state solution. Until this fundamental issue is resolved, the entire region will remain unstable, Israelis will never be safe, Palestinians denied basic human rights will continue to suffer under Israeli apartheid, and the Palestinian resistance will continue its sporadic mm -hmm. attacks, all of which undermines global stability and security. For things to change, the United States needs entirely new thinking, a new vision, and altogether new foreign policy agenda regarding the state of Israel and West Asia. This will only come to be when APAC loses the influence it currently holds over America's elected officials and policy elites, and indeed at all levels in Washington, within corporate media and academia, is broken. APAC, it is time to conclude, and must be broken. Peace in West Asia and the stability order elsewhere depend on this project. This way, the way forward, as I see it, is twofold. First, a bright light must be kept focused on Israel's war crimes and on its long established policy of apartheid. So, this is how I interpret this. Continue your tweets regarding Israel, especially that criticize Israel. And anything that you see that is reported, as long as it's true, tweet it out. At least for us in the audience, I think it's definitely important to do that. Um, second, and related to this, the history that has been erased must be resurrected. The history of Zionism, of the, found, of the founding of Israel, and of the sustained and systemic violence perpetuated against the Palestinian people. Along with this, 
the U.S. must come to terms with the historical presence and influence of Christian Zionism, a movement that sustains APAC's influence as it enables the expansion of illegal Israeli settlements. The project I described is in no way easily accomplished. It will necessitate a resent, relentless and sustained campaign on social media, within home independent journalism, and within the political arena, a project capable of re reaching deeply into American society and politics. It is an effort each of us can tape up according to our abilities and influence. Among other things, it will retire time and courage, including the courage to risk accusations of anti-sentiment, anti-sentimentism. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it may be that Israel's conduct itself is what will eventually break APAC's influence. People around the world, including in America, can see for themselves now as clearly as, I, as they did after the Abijah, sorry, massacre in 1953, that Israel's behavior is not rational or just that it constitutes an international program of ethnic cleansing. Above all else, America and ordinary Americans must regain a more balanced and critical perspective towards Israel, one that properly prevailed before the advent of APAC. Cool. I mean, as I said, long, but very <laughs> beneficial. You're done. You're done. What? Um, and hopefully APAC can be done before soon enough. But would be nice. I think shout to Indy for um sending me this article uh and so i think for I, I, guys you know you're charged so continue protesting continue mm -hmm. being loud on social media and otherwise tell people the reality of zion really it's and again let's make this clear judaism is not affiliated with zionism in any way let me make that clear right so what we're talking about here is Zionism, not Judaism, and not specifically Jews themselves. But if you're a Jew Zionist or a Christian Zionist, there's a problem. Okay? Yeah. APAC in of itself, is, in their name, is the problem that, you know, that has affected where we are right now. And so as you're aware of that, please educate as best as you can help. Once we clip them, show them this. You know, yep. have your friends and family or your Zionist friends or whoever read this article, you know, or even this stream, because we talked a lot about the Israel-Palestine conflict over the last few weeks. But, you know, but it's important to understand why APAC is dangerous. And we've been seeing this, you know, even subtly, even if you may not be aware of it, more than likely APAC has had a hand in it. So point being, yep. expose their asses and continue to be brave as much as you're able to without, obviously, we don't want people losing their jobs and shit, which has happened, and that's definitely a fear. Yeah. But, you know. Make sure as, you put your, you know, most extreme thoughts in the comments for Google to have in perpetuity um, with your name attached. Make sure you do that. Um, <laughs> do the doo-doo. Do the doo-doo. Oh, you ready for the last one?